Hello friends, it's The Stitches, and today I have a DIY that you guys actually voted on. I gave a couple choices, but stuffed animal bags won by a wide margin, although a not insignificant amount of you wanted both options. So I'll have to bring suspender skirts and shorts around for round two at some point. For today's video, I made two different bags. One is created using a teddy bear that I got at a thrift store, and the other is made entirely from scrap fabric, including the stuffing. So let's start with project number one, our simpler option of the two. This one gives you less creative freedom, but it also requires less technical skill. Bag number one is our thrifted option, so we'll start by finding our materials. I'm making both of these bags into crossbodies, so each one needs an adjustable strap. If you don't care about the strap being adjustable, skip this part and just use a strip of cotton webbing. To create my straps, I'm using this tutorial. It was the first one that showed up when I googled adjustable strap tutorial, but we'll still go through the steps together. I need one strap for each bag, and for each strap I'm using two yards of cotton webbing. But if you want to make a backpack, instead make two straps and you probably only need a yard and a half for each. Since the webbing is one inch wide, I need a one inch rectangle ring or two for each strap. However, you do see me holding a one and a quarter inch D ring because that's the closest thing my craft store had. <laughs> you also need a one inch slider bar. Our tutorial has us start by cutting a four inch bit of webbing for each of our D rings. Since you can't really use pins to secure the webbing, we'll use tape instead. Take the rest of the webbing and use some tape to mark a clear wrong side. This is that super flimsy painter's tape, by the way. I wouldn't recommend using like duct tape or anything like that. Now thread the slider through the webbing, matching right and wrong sides. The side of the slider bar where you can see the metal that folds over into the middle bit is the wrong side. Turn under a little bit of the end for seam allowance, and then fold the edge over again and tape it in place, leaving a couple inches between the seam and the slider bar as shown. Then take all of these pieces and stitch them in place. I'm going over it a few times with the sewing machine, but you can also use a back stitch with some embroidery floss if you don't have one. Now take the unfinished end of the webbing and thread it through one of your rectangle rings. Being careful not to twist the webbing and minding our right and wrong sides, thread the end through the slider bar now. And we have an adjustable strap. This next part is optional, but if you made the second D-ring situation, then we'll finish the end similarly to how we attached the slider. Thread the ring through the raw end a couple inches, and then turn the raw edge under. This also gets stitched down, either by machine or by hand. And now we have our adjustable strap. So, one piece of this project acquired. Next, we'll need to sort out our zipper situation. I already have a small collection of salvaged zippers, but none of them were quite the right length or color. So I just got a couple standard all-purpose zippers from the craft store. Make sure it's wide enough to accommodate your cell phone case. The actual stuffed animal I'll be using is this circa 2011 number that appears to be a Walmart Valentine's Day castaway. I did machine wash this immediately after I thrifted it, and I recommend you do the same. There are two things you need to keep in mind when buying your plush. It needs to have a big enough body to hold all of your items, and it needs a back seam that we can insert a zipper into. As punk rock as it would be to just go at this with a kitchen knife, a seam ripper will be more precise. The back seam gets opened up just a bit, and then we'll tear out enough stuffing for us to have a good space to fit our inner pouch for our items. I also thought the heart the bear was holding was just kind of ugly, so I removed that as well. Returning to the back seam, I'm using the zipper itself to compare the size of the hole we've created to make sure we have just enough room to insert it. 
We don't want the seam opened up too much or too little. Next, we'll make a pocket for storing our items in that we'll insert into the back seam in our plush animal. I'm just using some scrap fabric from another project to cut a pair of rectangles. You want to make sure the pocket is big enough for your items, but not so big that it makes the plush look odd when it's too full or when it's empty. This next part is totally unnecessary, but I also surged my pieces after I cut them out. But you can easily skip that step. Using the zipper to mark the seam placement, our two rectangles get pinned right sides together with enough of an opening for zipping and unzipping the back of the plush. Stitch these together either with a sewing machine running stitch or a back stitch if you're working by hand. Next, we'll need to iron down our seam allowance. First, we'll turn down the seam allowance on one side and firmly press it in place. Then we flip the whole thing over and turn and press the seam allowance on the other side. This will make it easier to stitch the pocket in place. With the seam allowance turned down, it's forced to stick out a little, which makes it easier to grab with our needle when we're stitching. Now we're ready to insert our pocket. We'll need our stuffed animal, our pocket, and our zipper, as well as some matching embroidery floss. We want embroidery floss instead of standard thread or buttonhole twist because this is the part of the bag that takes the most stress, and if we're hand stitching, we want the strongest option possible. Start by putting the pocket on your hand like so, and then use your hand to position the pocket into the middle of where we removed the stuffing. I'm pinning the pocket to the bare fabric here, but note that this is just to keep it in place during the next step, and I will have to take all of these pins right back out. Our zipper is going to be sandwiched in between the pocket and the teddy bear fabrics. So I'm basically just taking out a couple pins, positioning the zipper where it needs to be, and then repinning. If you've never used a zipper in your life in any of your own sewing projects before, they do come with instructions, but I highly recommend looking up a few tutorials just on zippers because they can be fairly tricky. I'm using a simple ladder stitch with my embroidery floss. The ladder stitch is sometimes called a slip stitch, but slip stitching can actually refer to multiple different stitches and also multiple different things in other different crafts, so I'm just gonna stick to calling it a ladder stitch, just for specificity. You just use your needle and take a little bite of that pocket fabric, then pierce through to the other side of the zipper, and then take a little bite of the teddy bear fabric, pierce back through to the other side of the zipper, and repeat. Then we knot at the end and we're ready to move on to the next step. Revisiting our strap from earlier, I'm using the embroidery floss to attach this as well. I'm also using the same method as before to stitch these on, but you can also just use a basic whip stitch. If the head of your plush animal is really big and floppy, you may need to attach your strap there, but I'll put mine on the teddy bear's shoulder. With the strap attached and the zipper finished, technically our bag is finished. And you can stop here, or we can add a little flair with some decorations. I want to add a little bit of a punkier edge to my teddy bear bag, so I went straight to my chain and jewelry finding stash, and I was immediately drawn to these heart connectors. So I made a chain out of the connectors using some matching jump rings, and then cut another length of chain that was just a couple inches smaller. Using a couple more jump rings, I put a pair of mismatched size rings at the end of both lengths of chain, just like so. And then I'll use jump rings to attach those mismatched rings to some safety pins. This will leave us with a little detachable chain detail that we can move around and reposition or even steal from our bear and use on a jacket if we want. And then I just played around with more chain and safety pins. 
I thought a little necklace might look cool. Clearly, one of the ears also needed to be lined with studs. I started with these bendy ones, but immediately realized that my fabric was way too thick for that, so we'll use screw-in ones instead. And of course, the only acceptable number of safety pins is more. And more. And more. Once the bag is satisfactorily decorated, our first project is completed. I'm super excited to wear this with an outfit and give you a final reveal, but this video is actually a double feature, and we have a whole second bag to make first. I already posted a sneak peek of our next bag on the community tab, so I know many of you have been absolutely waiting on the edge of your seat for this one, but... I am going to make you sit through a commercial break. Or maybe you have YouTube Premium and you're just staring at the Will Be Right Back card for a couple seconds in complete silence. Alright friends, we're back with a slightly more complex version of this project, but this option gives us virtually endless creative freedom. Before we can start, we need to select a pattern. I have here a few options that I think would be great for this that I also think would be really easy for you guys to get your hands on. The first one has a couple size options that allow you to make a big backpack version, uh, one that has some clothing options so you can twin with your bag, and this one that I ended up using because you can create either a bear or a bunny, as well as having a couple different size options. A quick note on using simplicity patterns, because I feel like this isn't that well known outside the Lolita community, and it should be. And I've also just never brought it up before, and I do use simplicity patterns sometimes, so I wanted to just put this here. But simplicity has been alleged to commit design theft before. Sometimes simplicity does work with different designs in order to make their patterns. So I'm not really sure how widespread the issue is, but there was a situation a couple years back where Simplicity was a special guest at a convention where they purchased and then allegedly stole at least two designs for bonnets, and then they also used a fabric that was made by a small designer without crediting them, and that particular designer has stated that they don't really appreciate their fabric designs being used commercially, and Simplicity Simplicity used it for a commercial purpose. So I'll put the info on the screen. You can pause to read it if you want. I'll also link it in the description. Obviously, this is all alleged. Like I said, I can't personally prove that they reverse engineered the designs or if they were just heavily inspired. And to be honest, the actual law here is really very murky and there's not a whole lot that the people that made the original designs can do about it. So yeah, that's just, um, a thing, I guess. It doesn't make you a horrible person to still use simplicity patterns. They are some of the most readily available and easiest to understand. Pattern language can be very inaccessible for beginners sometimes, but please don't spend $15 on a big brand commercial pattern. They will go on sale for 99 cents or $1.99 several times a year. If you already have a solid knowledge of using patterns and a little bit more money to spend, there are all kinds of independent pattern makers on Etsy and other places, and looking at indie designers will give you more animal options, so if you want like a dragon or a video game character or something else, you might be able to find it in the indie sphere. Anyway, long rant about simplicity being problematic aside. <laughs> If you want to create a plush just like the one I'm making, I used a simplicity pattern specifically so that no matter where you are in the world, you should be able to get your hands on it and follow it along with me. Specifically, I'm using simplicity 9306, but any design that has a back seam will work. So now that we have our pattern, we need to gather up some fabrics. I want to use this project to use up some scraps, so I picked out everything from my scrap in that fit the same color scheme and looked somewhat cohesive together. A little pattern mixing is fine as long as the print themes don't clash too hard and the colors match. 
For reference, I'm making view C, which is the smaller sized bunny. And the first thing we want to do is check the pattern to see which pieces we need to cut out. That winds up being 1 through 10 and 13 through 15. It also gives us a cutting layout, but we're doing patchwork, so we can ignore that entirely. For example, piece one says to cut two, so we'll cut out two pieces that mirror each other. That last bit is like super important to remember. I also had a couple short lengths of wide scrap lace, so I figured I could find a way to use them as an overlay on a few pieces. After deciding to add this lace to the front stomach piece, I thought a little bit of like grommet lacing or eyelet lacing would look really cute with it too. So I'll cut out a couple squares of fabric to turn into lacing tabs. I'm showing grommets here, but I did eventually decide on eyelets. Since I'm using scraps instead of polyfill for stuffing, I wanted to flatline my pieces with some scrap muslin, since the stuffing isn't a solid white and I don't want it to show through our pieces. We start by pinning our fashion fabric right side up onto the muslin, spacing our pins one inch apart or so, and then we'll cut around the fashion fabric. This needs to happen to every piece. After our pieces are cut out, we'll stitch the two layers of fabric together just inside the seam allowance. The seam allowance is pretty narrow on this pattern. Most simplicity patterns will have a 5 8 inch seam allowance, but this one has a 3 8 inch seam allowance. So I'm stitching at the quarter inch mark. You'll notice I stitched all the way to the edge on each piece instead of pivoting at the corners like you would typically. I also haven't bothered to backstitch since I'm going to serge the edges. Technically, the serging is optional, but if you have a serger, I highly recommend it because it makes a huge difference in terms of bonding the two fabrics together. The last thing I want to do to prep my fabric pieces is to stitch down the edges of the lace so it doesn't move around. And if you machine wash your purse and the lace shrinks, it will be forced to shrink evenly. I'm basically just quilting it down along the major design lines of the lace. So here are my finished cutout pattern pieces, and now we're ready to start actually sewing. The first thing I want to do is create the tabs for my lace-up detail on the front of the bunny. This is totally optional, and timestamps are in the description in case you want to skip it. So let's revisit those little squares I cut out while I was flatlining. We're going to fold them in half right sides together and then press the fold in place. And now we'll stitch as close to the edge as possible. My squares are two inches by two inches, by the way, but feel free to make them whatever size you want and use however many eyelets you want. After we've made our stitching line, we'll cut our corners and then turn and press our tabs. I use a corner press to make it easier. Press this very firmly. And now we'll top stitch around the edge of our tabs. Next, we'll use an awl to open up a couple holes for creating our eyelets. I played around with the idea of either using a matching or contrasting embroidery floss to stitch the eyelets, and eventually landed on a contrasting pale blue that roughly matched the blues in the printed fabrics I'm using. Creating eyelets is pretty simple. We just tightly whip stitch around the edge of the fabric on the holes we created. Once the eyelets are stitched, we can pin the tabs in place wherever we want them to sit on the stomach. I decided mine would look good roughly off-center in the middle of the stomach panel. When stitching, I'm simply running over my top stitching on the outer long edge of my tabs, leaving the other edges free. Now our tabs are done and ready for the lacing to be threaded, however I'm going to wait to do that last step until our bag is finished. We're ready to start stitching our pattern pieces together, so we'll refer to our pattern instructions for the rest of our tutorial. Our first step is to stitch the center front seam on the bunny's face, using piece 1. And again, the pattern instructs us to use a 3 8 inch seam allowance. The next couple steps are out of order because I thought the way that they attached the rabbit ears was honestly kind of silly and poorly thought out, but you'll see what I mean. For the next step, we're supposed to sew the seam connecting the center of the face to the sides of the face. However, this is the seam that I want to actually tuck my ears into. So I've pinned the piece in question in place, but this top piece where the ears will be placed, I'll unpin a bit. And now before we stitch this, we need to skip ahead and construct the ears. 
Just so that you understand what exactly I'm changing, the ears were originally supposed to sit a little further back and were just sewn on topically. For comparison, the bear ears were absolutely built into one of the seams, which is what I want to do with the bunny ears. So I'm going to move the bunny ears forward slightly and tuck them into the seam that they're supposed to be attached over, which means we actually need to sew the ears. We'll stitch our pieces right sides together to start. To make the ears look cleaner when they're turned, I'm cutting notches into my seam allowance. This removes bulk from the seam and it'll help the ears lay flatter. When I turn stuff like this right sides out, I always use a corner press even if it doesn't have corners. Just running a corner press along the seam helps it quite a bit. And then of course press the ears with a hot iron. I suppose top stitching the ears is optional and I don't actually think the pattern called for it, but I like top stitching things. And then the ears have a pleat in them. We'll create this by folding the fabric in half and then pinning it in place. We want to fold it with the fabric you want on the bottom of the ear facing out. And so the fabric that you want on the top of the ear will be on the inside. Now we'll make a short little line of straight stitching at the pattern markers, or ignore the pattern markers altogether and just make a one inch line at the only pattern dot you bothered to mark because that seems about right. Then press open the pleat we just created and baste along the inside of the seam allowance to hold it in place. Now we'll revisit that face seam that I plan to stick these in. Pin the ears into the seam with the allowances matched up. You also want to leave a tiny bit of space at the end. The ears shouldn't sit right on the edge because we need the seam allowance free for attaching the front of the head to the back of the head. And then we'll just stitch that seam. Now we'll attach the two pieces that make up the back of the head, which would be pattern piece three for those of you following along with the simplicity pattern. The front and the back of the head are then sewn together. Be sure to mind your seam placement and the ears when pinning these pieces together. And when stitching this together, be careful to avoid sewing over the ears. We don't want the ears to get stuck in that seam. Turning this right side out will give us the base for our bunny head. The pattern calls for safety eyes, however, I'm not planning on ever giving this to a child, and I would rather use some buttons from my stash over buying safety eyes. So I'm just going to stitch these vintage buttons in place over where the safety eyes would be, and then I guess just never let a toddler touch them. With the head finished, we're ready to move on to the body. The front of the body, aka piece 4, gets pinned together at the front seam and stitched in place. The legs are going to be attached via the seam that connects the front of the body to the back of the body, so we'll construct those now. The legs are pieces 5 and 6 on our simplicity pattern. We'll start with piece 5, which honestly looks like exactly what it is. This is stitched together leaving the bottom open and the top open and then a little gap is left on the back seam for stuffing. Now piece 6, which is the sole of the foot, is attached at the bottom. Pinning it isn't too tough, but stitching this tiny circular seam may be one of the toughest parts of this whole project. And then we'll need to cut a few notches out of the seam allowance on this as well. Once the curves are clipped, the legs can be turned. Matching up the seams, we'll pin the tops of the legs together. And then I just want to quickly baste that before I pin it to the body. Pin the legs to the body front, making sure the front of the feet are facing the right side of the fashion fabric. Stitch those in place just on the inside of the seam allowance. 
The bottom of the strap is stitched on top of one of the legs with the right side facing towards the right side of the fabric. Now we can set the front of the bunny aside. The back of the bunny is piece number seven of our pattern. Before we're ready to stitch them, we'll have to make the darts at the bottom of the pattern piece. The pattern also has us stitch the pieces together, leaving the back open for turning and stuffing, but we will not be doing that step. Instead, that's where we're going to put our zipper and also our inner pocket. When I flatlined my pieces, it was easiest to just leave the excess muslin, so I'll quickly cut that away. Then the dart seam is pinched together and pinned, so we can take this over to the sewing machine. When it comes to the center back seam, I'll be stitching up the top and the bottom part, leaving a gap in the center. However, I'm ignoring the pattern markers and going off of the size of the zipper. Then we'll stitch down those darts. Give that back seam a very good press. We want the seam allowance to behave while we insert our zipper, and pressing helps. And now here's that back piece with the zipper pinned into place. Of course, as always, remember to use a zipper foot and carefully, carefully stitch around the edge of the zipper. So now the back of our bunny is almost done, we just need to attach the inner pocket that will house our items in. I'm using the same scrap fabric that I used on the last project, and once again, I'm just basing the size off of the number of objects I usually carry, as well as the size of the bunny. And like our last project, we'll pin around the edge, leaving a gap that is the size of the zipper opening. And stitch around the edge of that pocket. And total deja vu, I know, press down the seam allowance on the edge at the opening. Next, we want to carefully pin the pocket in place around the zipper. We'll want to switch back over to our zipper foot and sew the pocket in place. I like to do the two long edges that run parallel to the zipper first, going over the top stitching. Then I do the tiny little edges at the top and bottom of the zipper, being careful not to sew over anything that I'm not supposed to. Now we're finally ready to attach the front of the bunny to the back. Ignore the overlapped diagrams that have managed to make their way into the final draft of this pattern, but we'll pin the two parts together to start. Between the legs and strap, there's actually quite a bit of bulk in the bunny body that we need to be careful to stitch around. But even with all the bulk, it wasn't too difficult to get around the entire seam without hitting anything. I don't remember if we're supposed to turn the bunny right side out yet, but I will so that we can see our progress so far. Look at that, head and body, zipper and everything. The next step is to make the arms, but this is a good moment to pause and take a break, so here are some quick commercials so I can feed myself. Before our ad break, we finished our bunny head and body, so we're ready to make the arms. This will involve pattern pieces 8, 9, and 10. Although, side note, simplicity, seriously, what is up with these overlapping diagrams? Piece 8 is the palm, and piece 9 is the inner arm. These will get attached to each other first, and then those will create a piece that will get sewn to piece 10. So we'll pin together the palm and the inner arm and take this over to the sewing machine. And then we'll want to press open that seam that we just stitched. When we sew this to the outer arm, we'll do so leaving a gap for, you guessed it, stuffing. Pin your arm pieces right sides together, and then stitch them together at the sewing machine. Like all of our other super curvy pieces, you'll want to cut notches out before turning it. And then once our arms are turned, we'll attach them to the next seam of our bunny. I figured this was also a good place to tuck in the strap, so after I pinned the arms down, I played around with the strap to see where it would look good. And now we'll stitch everything in place. 
After we finagle the bunny back into its inside out form, the bunny head is tucked into the body cavity and stitched on at the neck. I didn't mention this before, but this is a good place to mention it. You're gonna want to open up a little bit of the back seam on the head of the bunny. It doesn't instruct you to do that in the pattern for some reason, although it shows there being a gap there later. I'm not really sure why. When pinning the head to the neck, be sure to match your side seams and that the head is facing the right way. <laughs> Stitching around this tiny little circular seam is also one of the hardest parts of this project. This next step really works best if you're actually going to use polyfill, as I would soon discover, but we will carefully try to do the eye indent. Without turning the plush, yank the head out of the body and locate some buttonhole twist of any color. Thread a couple needles and use them to pierce the seam allowance of the fabric directly behind the safety eyes, or in our case, the buttons that we're using for eyes. The thread needs to cross over the face and then the needle will be pushed through to the outside of the plush at the armpit. If it doesn't make a ton of sense, that's okay. Just refer back to the diagram and try to copy it. Once the needles are pushed through to the right side, turn the bunny bag right side out, being careful not to stab yourself with those needles. And yes, you are just gonna kinda leave them dangling there for a little bit. Now it is finally time to stuff our bunny. But I have one last bone to pick with this pattern. Now I knew I would have to improvise for the back seam because that's where the zipper went. So I opened up the side seam under the armpit on one side of the bunny to stuff the body, which is also where I turned the plush right side out. But how on earth are you supposed to use the center back seam on the head to stuff the bunny when the instructions told you not to leave a gap? So I had to open that up too. So let's talk stuffing. If you sew regularly, you know that it generates a ton of fabric waste. Obviously utilize bigger scraps for smaller projects whenever you can, but you will also wind up with those little teeny tiny pieces that are just simply too small to do anything with. We're going to gather up as much of that as we can and use a rotary cutter to chop it up as fine as you can. The smaller your pieces, the smoother and less lumpy your final project will be. This bag represents about a year's worth of scraps, maybe two. To be honest, I have no sense of time anymore. I'm sure the Bernadette banners of the crowd have various cutesy names for this. Considering scrap fabric is referred to as cabbage in the historical costuming world, sometimes this affectionately gets called coleslaw when it's chopped up like this. But um, fun fact, not so fun for me, but fun for you, I guess. I actually had a job where I had to make coleslaw in huge bulk amounts. And let me tell you, the sauce has a whole different smell when you work with several pounds of it at a time. So I will not be using the term coleslaw affectionately because honestly I'm still a little bit traumatized. Besides, to me, cabbage will only ever refer to friendship. Once your stuffing is prepared, it functions largely the same as polyfill. Simply stuff it in and use a ladder stitch to close up the open seams where the stuffing was inserted. Although this is a much messier process than using polyfill. It definitely doesn't stick together the same. When you get to the body of the plush, be sure to stuff it enough that the bunny won't look odd if it isn't full of items, but don't stuff it so much that you lose the function of the inner pouch. And also, while you're stuffing it, make sure to place the stuffing around the pouch. Like, try to make sure that the pocket stays firmly in the center of the stuffing. Open up the back and move your hands around in the pocket to ensure that you can still fully use it and that it's sitting where it's supposed to be. Time to revisit those sharp objects dangling from the armpits of our bunny. Grip the needle and tug as hard as you can without breaking the thread. You will immediately notice that it's much more difficult to do this when you're not using the intended stuffing. 
but it did seem like it was doing something. So it was still worth going through this step, I guess. I decided our rabbit needed a spiffy little bow tie, so I tied some ribbon around its neck and gave it a good double knot. To keep the ribbon from fraying, I ran over it with a lighter real quick. The eyelet tabs on the front would typically be laced with more ribbon, but I thought actual lace would be even cuter. Next we'll move on to the nose and tail, which are both fairly simple. Our tail is number 15 in our pattern instructions, and it's just a big circle. Just quickly using some hand basting, we'll gather it around the edge. Once it's gathered, we stuff it with some more scraps. By the way, after this project, this is all of the shredded scraps I have left compared to the, the massive bag and a half that I had before. This is not a zero waste project. It's a negative waste project. Now we'll hand stitch the tail on after it's gathered and stuffed. I'm using a modified version of a back stitch to make a slightly stronger bond. Our final step is to attach the nose. Simplicity apparently just glued theirs on, but that isn't gonna fly here. I'm using some scrap felt so I can applique it on with a whip stitch without it fraying. I also have some embroidery floss that matches the felt. And then once the nose is attached, we're done. That's the end of our second bag project. And here's our finished bunny. There's a little bit of wonkiness here and there, which serves as a reminder that my specialization is in garments and not plush animals, but I still think it's cute. And here's our two bags side by side. I wanted them to be very different aesthetics to show how stuffed animal bags can actually fit into a wide range of styles. Normally with other thrift flips, I show a before and after. So here's our plush before and our bag after from our first project. And then just for laughs, the pile of fabric scraps compared to our finished bag on the second project. Clearly our chain covered bear bag will fit easily into darker alternative looks like pumpkin goth. I get asked where this sweater is from every time I wear it and the answer is I don't actually know. I thrifted it and the tag just says the letter J. Also rest assured that I'm wearing a nude bodysuit underneath this so it looks much more risque than it actually is. Other than this particular outfit needing some more accessories, I'm excited for all the future teddy bear bag moments to come. Since the bunny bag is full of so many little details, and the blue scraps are actually the same fabric from my blue Lolita JSK, I couldn't resist wearing the two together. If there is a fashion that was made for ridiculous, useless purses of questionable design, it's Lolita. The patchwork honestly opens this second project up for being matched with any style, and it really helps use up those tiny little pieces of beautiful prints that you can't force yourself to toss, as well as all those little bits of lace you really only have a few inches left of. That's all for today. I did not intend for this video to take me a month to make, but hopefully it was worth the wait. I would love to see any bags you guys make inspired by this tutorial, so feel free to tag me on Insta or wherever else. And with that, I'll see you all next time. Bye!